This generation is an amazing generation. Never before in all of Earth's history has a generation been so capable of being connected, so capable of doing so many things. And at the same time, by way of cognitive dissonance, so unconnected and so disconnected. You can have 2,000 friends on Facebook and only know four of them. You can be so close to everybody in church and so lonely. You can be the most popular person in school and wondering if anybody cares about you. You can be in that space between being too old to be a child and too young to be an adult. And you wonder, where do I fit in? What will I be? You can be between being a young adult and single and wondering, who will I marry? What will that look like? I'm certainly not a youth anymore. I'm in between. This generation is an interesting generation, isn't it? Well, is there anybody here that is between the ages of 8 and 16? Raise your hand, 8 and 16. Is there anybody here under 8 years old? Is there anybody over 16 years old to 24 years old. Raise your one. One, two, three, four. Good, we're glad you're here. Is there anybody between 24 and 35? And everybody that's over 35, raise your hand. <laughs> we have multiple generations here today. I am so glad our youth that were able to lead out in worship today. How about you? I don't believe that they are the future of the church sometime in the distance. I believe they are the generation of the church. And those who are a few years older have the responsibility of mentoring and modeling what Christianity is all about. Do you believe that? Yes. This generation is so connected and has such wonderful opportunity to take this gospel to a perishing world. So if you're in that generation of somewhere between five and something after it, listen carefully. I occasionally go to my source when I have a few minutes in the afternoon sometimes and I want to explore the vast wonders of the universe, I'll type in what's the speed of light. Up on the screen, it'll flash 186,000 miles per second. I'm going, that's wonderful that I have that information. It's amazing what you can find. Everything's available at your fingertips. What's the telephone number for 5,000 people in the United States? What do you want? A, A to C, C to M? I'll take anything, just pop it up. I typed something in and I gained a little knowledge base that is rarely open to men. I stumbled across um, a person's reflection. I believe this generation is so connected sometimes, but so lonely and unconnected at the same time. And I, I stumbled across a web page that gave me an insight to the mysteries of how women think. Sometimes. A very dangerous place for a man to go alone. What's that where no man dares to go, that old, old verbiage? But listen, gentlemen, ask your wives, your girlfriends later if it's actually true. One lady reflecting on what it meant to be chosen penned these words. This is something we were discussing in our Bible study just yesterday. It's something as women, we want to feel. We long to be seen, really seen. We discussed that 
when we were growing up. We longed to be picked for different sports teams. We longed to be chosen to go to the prom. We longed, uh, we could not share some horror stories about not being chosen, not feeling special enough to be picked. At least that's what we told ourselves at different times. Maybe you didn't, most, but most certainly I did from time to time. I had an experience like that recently, very recently, that made me think about this whole concept of being chosen. It has to do more with chivalry. It has to do with what we as women should put up with and what we shouldn't. My ears perked up. It's about a date. And believe you me, I've had enough bad date stories to last me the rest of my life. But this isn't the point. The point is, I had a good date. It was a blind date. Scratch that. It was a decent date. Conversation, uh, decent conversation for a first date. But there are three things that added up to a red flag for me when processing the whole thing. Dear Lord, please don't let him find this on my blog. Well, perhaps on second thought, maybe he should. She went on to explain. First, when he called me, he left a voicemail to ask me out. It went something like this. I'm just now getting around to calling you. How charming. I thought, really? Leaving a message on the voicemail. But then I thought, after all, he called. I'll accept his invitation. I put it out of my mind. Uh, we were When we were, had the date, things seemed to go well. I enjoyed the time when we were together. I asked him as we were leaving, where did you park? He said, just up a couple blocks. And I said, I'm down just a couple blocks. And he said, I'll walk you part way there. <laughs> you already caught it, didn't you? And sure enough, he did. He walked me about halfway to my car and said goodnight and turned around. I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder how this will go. I put it out of my, out of my mind for just a few minutes and thought, well, he only walked me part of the way, perhaps on the next date, He'll walk me all the way to my car. The third thing that kind of troubled me, she penned, I went out on a limb when I hadn't heard from him. The next day, I text him a message. Girls, if you're listening, bad idea. If he's not interested in texting you, don't chase him. He's not worth it. So I texted him and I said, thank you very much for the date. I enjoyed myself. No text back. He must not be feeling the love, I thought. But the next morning, he gets around to texting. He said, sorry, I was driving when I got your text and forgot to text you back. Forgot, I thought. Forgotten. Ugh. So needless to say, there will not be a second date. If you're treating me that, with that much thoughtlessness already, that does not bode well for you. Thanks, but no thanks. Is chivalry dead? Nope, I don't believe so. It just doesn't make an appearance in my life in any certain consistent way. Really? R I serve a God that sees me, really sees me. He knows me. He chooses me. And there's nothing I have to do to earn his love. He gives it to me so freely, peace. He says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart. So today, I'll soak in those words. He chooses me. He loves me for exactly who 
I am. He pursues me with an unconditional love. I believe that's the type of God we serve. How about you, friends? Every soul longs to be pursued. Every soul longs to be chosen. Everybody longs to be valued. And if all the genera- of all the generations, I believe today there is a dearth of love shown to the generation that is growing up in our midst today. We don't do it intentionally. We do it by accident. We don't willingly neglect spending time with our children. We just get too busy. We told that we loved them three weeks ago and told them if anything changed, we'd let them know. We assume that we express the fact that we buy them big houses and put good clothes on them and send them to the best schools. They'll know the deep love that we have for them as adults and parents. Don't ever take it for granted. Don't ever overlook the opportunity to express your love to them. It is this generation that God gives the message that I'll share with you this morning. Open your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. We find there the choosing. We find there the calling. And we find there the choices that God wants us to make. 2 Peter chapter 2 says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes desire the sincere word of the milk uh, milk of the word that you might grow thereby if so you've tasted that the lord is gracious to whom coming as unto a living stone disallowed indeed of men but chosen of god and precious and then he says you are as lively stones are built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Do you get the imagery here? God has chosen you. It's like building a brick wall or a stone wall. One stone goes in, another stone goes in, another stone goes in, until the fullness of the wall is strong. And all it takes is the removal of one stone. Does the wall crumble at the first stone or brick you remove from the wall? No. Is it weaker? Yes. Remove another stone. Is it weaker? Yes. Remove the third stone. Is it weaker? Yes. Until at some point, the wall starts to sag and crumble. So too with the family of God. You may feel that your participation in this family often goes unnoticed, not by God, friends, not by God. You might feel that your participation is so minor, not in God's eyes, it's not. It's this generation, it's each individual coming together as as the picture, the stones in the wall that the house of God might be built that we might be a community of believers together. As lively stones, you're built up in the spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices, verse 5 says, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore, it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and that he he believeth on him shall not be confounded. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. It is this stone that we build our faith. This generation must build their lives on the uh, on the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unto therefore which believeth he is precious, but unto them which are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head corner. And a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they are appointed. But verse 9, if you have a pencil, if you have a pen, underline this verse in your Bible and read it frequently. But but you, you are a chosen what? 
You are a chosen people, a chosen generation. You are a chosen generation. Listen to me closely, friends. It's not the generation of a hundred years ago. It's not the generation that might be two or three generations out. It's this generation that he is speaking to. God has always had a last day generation. He wants to take his people home in this generation's time. Do you believe it, friends? He's lonely for you to be in his presence, physical presence in the sight of God. But he wants you to live in his presence in a spiritual sense today. You are a chosen generation. Follow along, verse 9. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him on uh, of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in past times were not a people, but now the people of God, which have attained mercy, but now have which did not have mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Do you see the progression in the uh, in the progression of this chapter. One time, a people without the mercy of God, but today we have the mercy of God poured out upon us, called out of darkness into light, chosen to be the people of God. Do you like that, friends? If I've got to be chosen, I want to be chosen to be on God's team. I don't want to be chosen to be on the other team. I can get there just about any way, I, any day and any way I want. The devil is so ready to say, I've, <laughs> I've already chosen you. I'm making it easy. The temptations are right before you. Just make bad choices in your life. Just follow the easy way and you'll, you'll be part of my team. I'm not interested in being on that team. I want to be on the team of Christ. I want to be part of his precious people. He has already made the pathway clear. He has already chosen you. He has already chosen me. The problem is, however, we responded to his invita invitation. It reminds me. It reminds me of my sophomore year sitting in Bible class. My roommate and I sat in the back of the room to scope out. Well, you know what we're scoping out. Although the Bible text that the professor was writing on the blackboard, and occasionally in between when he was writing, we were looking for attractive young ladies in the class. Hmm, can you imagine that? Well, my roommate back in the room said, why don't you call her up? And I said, well, wait a minute. You know, I don't know. He pestered me for a few weeks, and so I said, well, I'm not doing it. He said, why don't we go out and double date? I said to myself, okay, you know, what am I going to do? Make popcorn and sit in the, sit in the dorm room and um, study Saturday night? Mm, I don't think so. Valentino's pizza tastes, well, you haven't eaten if you haven't had it, Valentino's pizza. Anybody have Valentino's pizza? Oh, we have, we have one redeemed one, one redeemed one here. It's worth the journey. It's only about 1,500 miles away. <laughs> you can fly it in. I picked up the phone. Ring, 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 ring. Ring, 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 ring. The other side, the girl's dorm picks up the phone. Hello? Yes. Hi, this is Rick Wolfer calling. How would you like to go out for pizza Saturday night? Um... Not too much on the other end. Uh, yeah, that sounds like fun. Okay, I'll pick you up at 7. Hang up the phone. 7 o'clock comes. We go out. Have a delightful time. A second date, a third date, a fourth date, a fifth date. Somewhere down the, down the stream of time, she lets me know. Well, when you called me the first time, I was extending the invitation. It wouldn't have done any good if she had said, Who? Thank you. Goodbye. I was extending the invitation, and I was hopeful that the response would be positive, and it was. And she waited several years to tell me, probably because she just realized that 
the male segment of this world is so fragile. <laughs> Some were over supper. She said, you know when you called me? I said, you remember when I first called you? Oh, yeah, I do. She said, I went back to my dorm room and I picked up the student directory and I had to find you in the student directory to find out who you were. She's still with me to this day. You can, you can get her side of the story another time. It's an amazing thing that God does to this generation. He invites us. He chooses us. He pours out his mercy, his love in unconditional ways. But we have to open our hearts to him and accept that mercy and grace. So, this is for the 8 to 16 year olds after the choosing and after the saying yes. There's a critical piece of walking in the light. He's called us out. He's called us to walk differently than others walk in this world. Uh, ecclesia means call out, out of darkness into light. It's the same verbiage as when uh, they're in the military, uh, the military of days of old. They would be calling out special people. It's good to be a special person. When God calls you out, you're special. When God calls you out, you weren't created just to live this life, to build three houses and have six kids and the best of everything, to live life just for yourself. He called you to have a relationship with him, to glorify him, to take his love to a perishing world. So he calls you to make good choices. Now, what are good choices? Follow along in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. We're just going to hit a few of them today, and we're going to do it rather briefly. The first thing is in verse 11. Dear, uh, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. So the first thing when you're making choices, as you're going through the teenage years and young adult years, is avoid, avoid temptations of the world. Just avoid them. If you have to say, wait a minute, this is really tempting. Say, wait a minute, let me go to the Word of God and see. Let me check this, what I'm about to do against the Word of God. The second is found in the next verse. The second, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now you have to understand that having your conversation honest doesn't mean your words are honest. In the Greek, it means your behavior is honest. So that your behavior, the second piece as you're growing up is have behavior that is pleasing to the Lord. Walk in a way in all of your behavior, in all of your doing, in such a way that you will bring honor and glory to God so that you don't have to tell them you're a Christian. They will be able to see it in the way you're behaving. You're not going to be the one that will be keying their car. You're not going to be the one that will be throwing eggs on their house. You're not going to be the one that will be running their mailbox over because you're mad at them. You're not going to be the one that will be backbiting them. Make sure your behavior is reflective of Christ. The third, uh, the third piece there is that uh, you'll be honest in your behavior. Uh, the good works, let them do good works that they might glorify God in the day of visitation. The fourth is submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be uh, to the king as supreme. So as you go through early young adulthood and into your adulthood, what will keep you out of trouble the most is to obey the laws of the land. Oh, let me see. I'm out tonight and I got dad's car, the keys, half a tank of gas. He's never going to know that these tires will lay 20 feet of smoke going through the intersection. He'll never find out. I just got to go a little faster, just a little bit in a 45-mile-an-hour zone. And when you get pulled over at 70, 
You might have some answer and explaining to do to dad and everybody else. Keep yourself out of trouble. Keep yourself obeying the laws of the land. Bring honor to what it means to be a Christian. The scripture says obey those laws of the community. The fifth is seek God's will. Skipping down to 15. For so if it is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish man. There are those who will say there is no God, but as you obey the will of God and as you live it out, you will disprove what they are saying. The sixth is, be a servant as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as a servants of God. Serve one another. Serve your mom and dad. Serve your children. Uh, the seventh, skipping, I skipped uh, the numbering of one, is honor all men and love the brethren and fear God. Be filled. Be filled with the good attributes of God. Have your life filled with honor and love and respect for God. The eighth is found in verse 20. For what glory is it? Be patient with all. If when you be buffeted by your faults, you shall take it patiently. But if you do well and suffer it not, but take it patiently, this is acceptable to God. What he's saying here is if you've wronged somebody and somebody rebukes you, be patient. It's proper. If you haven't done wrong, and somebody's talked about you, be patient. It's good to be patient. If you're going through teenage years and you know you've got that, I got to have it, and I got to have it yesterday, I've got to have it now, it doesn't matter, I'll spend everything I have right now, I don't know if I'll be here in two hours, it's just right now in the moment. Everybody, anybody ever live that way? Oops. I've seen, I've seen 64 year olds. I better not go there. <laughs> Sometimes living that way. Oh, did you see this brochure? Yes. We can go there. Cancun next week. We've got one credit card that has just enough left on it, never mind the 18 that are maxed out. Let's go have some fun. Let's make the reservation now, because I want to do it now, because I have to have it now. Step away and learn that patience is good. The ninth way of making good choices is to follow Jesus. Follow Jesus as we come to the close of uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to move in our choices to responding to the choice. For even where to you are called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should what? We should what? What does your Bible say? We should follow in his steps. If you're going to follow, follow somebody who's worth following. Follow Jesus. Pick a good mentor. Find an earthly mentor. Find a, find a father, a brother. Find a sister, a mother, a spiritual mother to you. Follow them, but more importantly, follow in the ways of Jesus. I think I've heard that before, haven't you? When you're making choices, follow in the example of Jesus. Verse 22, and here is his example. Here is his example in his life. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Who did no sin, neither guile was found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not. When you're making choices, when you're making choices, the best thing is not to choose sin. Kind of stating the obvious to Christians, isn't it? 
Kind of stating the obvious, but I don't know how it is in your life. I find myself going, wait a minute. When I go into the land of temptation, I go, oh, do, 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 just a little bit, do, do, and just a little bit more, and it's not sin yet, just temptation, just temptation, just temptation, until I lose where I am in my perspective in my relationship with Christ. Jesus said his relationship was with the Father was so close that in his life there was how much sin? No sin. I have no doubt there's no one in this sanctuary that has that experience because Scripture says, talk to me afterwards if I've offended you. <laughs> Scripture says, how many have sinned? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the amazing thing is, he accepts us. But when you're making a choice, ask yourself, is what I'm about to do sinful? And if it is, just turn around and run the other way. When the devil comes calling, don't answer the door. When he comes tempting, don't go there. When he comes knocking again, just don't go there. Flee to Jesus and lean on him. Christ, verse 22, 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body upon the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whom stripes we were healed. For you were like sheep gone astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. O oh, friends, this generation this generation is chosen. This generation is called. But this generation must make choices. Are you willing to make that choice to follow Jesus wherever he wants you to go? However he wants you to make changes in your life to kneel before the, the foot of the cross again today. Let us pray. Father, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing to behold Jesus dying on the cross because of our rejection, the sin in our life. It's an amazing thing, Father, that your Spirit still calls us back to you. It's an amazing thing when the waves of guilt, when the waves of despair come crashing in in the late hours of the night, in the lonely times, in the desperations of the heart that you never forsake us, but that you remind us, I've chosen you. I've called you. Just come on to me. So, Father, in the quietness of this house of worship, we come humbly out of our desperate need to be filled with you that this generation, me and you, might follow Jesus and live to glorify him in all of our choices. Through Christ's precious name, amen.